So let's talk about events. Everything that happens has its own time and place, along with the potential to shape the path we take through life. Though most events pass right by us without us ever giving them a second thought, a single one might define our past, determine our future, or even change the whole course of history. So, how do we actually talk about them, and how does the way our language is put together let us understand how we sense and structure the world around us? I'm O.T. Lieberman, and this is The Link Space. Welcome to The Ling Space. Since our earliest episodes on the study of meaning, we've argued for the idea that the invented symbolic languages of logic and math are good ways to think about the natural languages that humans use every day. We've used symbols to represent the meanings of connecting terms like and and or, to track the order that words combine in, to separate the actual from the merely possible, and to visualize how meanings can narrow down to nothing or expand without limit. At the very foundation of it all, we made the basic assumption that verbs like lie or witness act a lot like predicates, the terms that drive the sentence. In the language of logic, predicates just show up as another kind of symbol, usually uppercase letters like L or W. What makes them special is that they combine with other letters, typically lowercase, to form complete logical statements. So a sentence like Olivia lied could be written out in logic as L-O, with that O standing in for Olivia. Meanwhile, Jennifer witnessed her own demise would be W-J-D, with that J and D pointing out Jennifer and her demise, respectively. Logic is handy here, because verbs and predicates seem to have a lot in common, at least on the surface. They're both a bit fragmentary by themselves, but lead to completed expressions when we pair them off with the right kinds of things. We can even use logic to capture the fact that verbs need to combine with specific numbers of words to feel whole, by tacking placeholder symbols onto our predicates like x and y. Lx signals that the predicate is looking to combine with one item, like how y needs a subject, while wxy needs to combine with two, just like how the verb witness needs both a subject and an object. It seems safe to suppose, then, that verbs and predicates are basically the same kind of thing, just in two different languages, one natural and one artificial. And we can safely use our understanding of one to help get a better grip on the other. But semantics, which is the study of meaning, isn't just about how individual words and their definitions fit together. It's about whole sentences, too, and how they relate to each other. And when we take this into account, we start to see cracks forming in our otherwise neat and tiny logical model. Think of the sentence, Katarina grieved for many years. In ordinary English, it's easy to see that there's a relationship between this and the much shorter Katarina grieved. It's clear that both uses of grieve involve one and the same verb. But as simple and intuitive as this seems, it's an idea that isn't so easy to render in the language of logic. In the first case, we've got the verb combining with a subject and a prepositional phrase. In the second, we've just got a subject. We could symbolize all this using two different predicate symbols, say, gx and gxy, where one combines with only one element to produce a full statement, while the other combines with two. So, Katarina grieved for many years would be gkm, while Katarina grieved would simply be gk. But biting this logical bullet and supposing that there are actually two marginally different kinds of grieving, one that works with a prepositional phrase and one that doesn't, seems to miss the point and it blurs the line between what's essential for a complete sentence, like a subject, and what's only optional. A deeper problem is that we completely fail to capture that intuitive connection we talked about. There's no rule in logic that recognizes that similar predicates, otherwise built to combine in slightly different ways, are essentially the same. There's no notion of similarity in logic. Things are either exactly identical or they aren't, with no in-between. In general, then, if we want to use logic as a tool to model and understand language, we need a way of representing the meanings of things like prepositional phrases and adverbs and other modifiers, which sometimes show up and sometimes don't. In trying to get a handle on the problem, back in the 1960s, philosopher Donald Davidson proposed a fundamental change to the makeup of logic. Davidson suggested that, in order to get a grip on how verbs really work, we need to add in an extra ingredient. Instead of thinking of predicates as simply relating an individual to an action, 
He supposed that predicates really should be thought of as describing whole events, which might include actions, but could also offer up details about who participated, when it happened, where it took place, and how it all went down. In symbolic terms, this means that each of the predicates we've been working with up to now don't directly apply to individuals, but instead characterize events. A predicate like GX would instead be recast as GE, with that E acting as a placeholder for any event the predicate might describe. Under this view, making a statement in logic amounts to saying there exists some event which fits that description. So, Katarina grieved would be written out like this, with that backwards E saying that the predicate following it applies to at least one event out there in the world, an event involving grief. And the job of describing who did the grieving shifts over to another predicate whose focus is to introduce the agent. By explicitly referencing events, we add a little complexity to our logical system, but we also make important gains. Now, if we want to say that Katarina grieved for many years, all we have to do is stick in an extra predicate, one that combines with the same act of grieving from before, and says it took place over many years. This lets us preserve the connection between the logical representations of all these different sentences, no matter how long or short, since each of them involves the same core predicate symbol G. Any other information, like about where or when the event took place, can be tossed in as needed, without making any changes to the main predicate at the center of it all. The work of one predicate now gets spread out over many. So talking directly about events in this way is convenient, because it lets us represent in logic the same kinds of relationships that we see in natural language. But does this mean this is how language actually works? After all, logic is a tool, and it could turn out that this fix of ours is nothing more than some handy redecorating that doesn't really say anything deep about our psychology. So, while it makes a certain amount of sense that the meanings of verbs should reference events, is there any independent evidence to suppose this gets us any closer to understanding what we know when we know a language? Well, consider the following sentence. James is a scruffy, no-nonsense time traveler. Notice that at least a couple of things follow from this. For one, it ends up being true that James is a scruffy time traveler, and that James is a no-nonsense time traveler. It also follows, of course, that James is a time traveler. For obvious reasons, these sentences form what's called a diamond entailment pattern, with every sentence entailing, that is, guaranteeing the truth of, the sentences below it. Filling in the rest of the diamond, where we can consider the conjunction of the middle two sentences, so James is a scruffy time traveler, and James is a no-nonsense time traveler, we see that they also entail the sentence above. The reason that this pattern is interesting is because, somewhat mysteriously, it doesn't always work. Consider the sentence, James spoke to Ramsay in the forest at night. It's again true that James spoke to Ramsay in the forest, and that James spoke to Ramsay at night. And of course it follows that James spoke to Ramsay. But what's interesting is that when we join up the middle sentences, so James spoke to Ramsay in the forest, and James spoke to Ramsay at night, they no longer guarantee the truth of the sentence at the top. In other words, they can both be true on their own without those conversations having happened in the same place and at the same time. In fact, it's perfectly reasonable to guess that James has probably spoken to his good friend Ramsay more than once, and that one of those conversations might have been in the forest, but during the day, with another happening somewhere else at night. We can't conclude that both sentences necessarily describe the very same event, and so our diamond can't be polished off, but why should this be? To better understand what's going on here, let's go ahead and adjust our first example. Instead, let's say, someone is a scruffy, no-nonsense time traveler. Now, we get the same effect as our second example, Everything below still follows from the top, but the compound sentence, someone's a scruffy time traveler, and someone's a no-nonsense time traveler, doesn't entail what's above it, since each half could be talking about someone different, meaning no one person fits both descriptions. Someone puts a crack in our diamond. And this makes sense, since none of these sentences are talking about anyone in particular. They're just making the general claim that some person or other fits the bill. If our event-driven logic from before is the right way to think about how sentences with verbs like speak or grieve work, we can easily account for this. If every sentence is, at its base, a claim about the existence of some event, 
in the same way that any sentence with someone in it is a claim about some unnamed person, the parallels between them make sense, as do the differences with more particular statements that describe specific individuals, like our first example, where the diamond pattern holds. Taking this event logic to heart, it gets a lot easier to explain how the meanings of expressions like at the facility or in the past come about, and how they combine with verb phrases. Much like how adjectives restrict the individual or individuals described by a noun phrase, prepositional phrases like these narrow down the events described by the verb in both time and space, and manner adverbs like quickly or quietly end up working much the same way. Finally, talking about events gives us inroads into understanding the class of verbs that deal with direct perception, like see or hear, as in Cassandra saw James disappear. In these sentences, it looks like the object of the verb is an entire other event. But with our new semantic technology, explaining these kinds of sentences, along with the semantics of adverbs and prepositional phrases and the like, is a cinch. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you made it to the event on time, you learned that while traditional logic gets a lot right about how the meaning of a verb fits into different sentences, it can miss how those sentences relate to each other. That making direct reference to events gives us the fix we need, explaining how details about time and place can put limits on the meaning of a verb phrase, and that diamond entailment patterns provide evidence that the logic of events forms an important part of our mental grammar. The link space is made by all these amazing people over here. If you want to learn more about different kinds of events, check back on our website. And while you're there, why not check out our store? We're also on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you want to keep expanding your own personal link space, please subscribe. And tap that little notification bell down below if you want to find out right when we post a new video. See you next time. Get trajo bona.